Um, yes, thank you, Erin. All right, so welcome back. Uh, hopefully folks will be able to find the room. We are starting panel six, storytelling and role-playing game. Um, and there's been a slight change to the program. Mike Solo, unfortunately, was not able to participate today. Uh, however, we still have three amazing talks uh, and that will actually give us some more time for, um, for Q&A afterwards. So without further ado, I'm gonna ask uh, Devi Acharya to go ahead and put on, uh, you know, share screen and all that. Um, so we will start with Devi Acharya, whose talk is uh, Understanding and Supporting Player-Driven Storytelling in Tabletop Role-Playing Games. Devi Acharya is a PhD student at the uh, Expressive Intelligence Studio at the University of California, Santa Cruz. Her work uh, lies at the intersection of cooperative play and interactive storytelling. She's currently researching tabletop role-playing games and how people can work together with the com computational systems to tell stories together. Uh, and since we're back to this kind of format, I'm just gonna ask uh, that folks, as they have questions, put that in the Q&A section. Um, feel free to keep chatting and, and having the great conversations that we've been having for the last two days, which has been amazing. Um, but that way we can you know, weed out the, the questions that we actually want answered at the end of the talk. Um, so without further ado, I will uh, take it over to Davey. Yeah, thanks so much for that introduction. Um, can I get permission to share my screen? It looks like it's not letting me do that right this very second. Maybe now? Uh -huh. Yes, perfect. Hey. Thank you so much. No problem. Um, can I start my video? No? Okay, well, that's fine. I don't need video. All right, let's do this. All right, uh, thanks so much for being here, everyone. Um, I'm Devi. I am a PhD student at the Expressive Intelligence Studio at UC Santa Cruz, and, and thank you for that introduction. Um, and I'm here to talk a little bit about my research. So, um, yeah, so um, at the Expressive Intelligence Studio, a lot of what we do and are interested in is um, interactive storytelling, interactive narrative, and that sort of thing. Um, and what I focus on in my research is that sort of intersection between those and tabletop role-playing games. Because um, for me, this is like sort of a really interesting space of possibility. So we have existing um, procedural narrative systems. Um, for those of you that are not familiar, um, a lot of this is sort of focused around computational systems for generating stories or to sort of generate stories based on like things the player do, sort of an interaction between a human and a computer system. Um, and a lot of what happens in procedural narrative systems, the kinds of things that um, people are exploring in those, um, in creating those systems is similar to the kinds of things that go on in tabletop role-playing games. So a lot of uh, what the GM is doing or a game master of tabletop role-playing games is doing this sort of improvisational storytelling process, right? So it's like, how can I sort of spin up a story that maybe has a little bit of structure, um, but is also improvisational that maybe has the things that I want it to have, but it also is sort of built on the things that the players do. Um, and I think that this is just like a very interesting space to explore in terms of research. Um, then you can see that there's a third element of this Venn diagram here, mixed initiative systems. So like what I'm interested in is not sort of the typical lean of some work in like uh, exploring the sort of space of the digital and tabletop role playing games. A lot of um, some of that existing work focuses on like, oh, how can we create a digital GM, you know? How can we take the things that GMs do and completely put that in the, the digital sphere. Um, and you can see that in some existing projects like, um, I don't know, like AI Dungeon is kind of similar to this. It's like, oh, like you're working with a computer system, um, but the system sort of becomes the GM. Uh, instead, I'm interested in how we can sort of create tools for GMs that help to support the human in their creative storytelling. Um, and in order to do that, I've uh, been conducting interviews with GMs, talking to them about their process. So um, for those of you who have run tabletop role-playing games before or played in them, or even really know about them, um, some of what comes up in these interviews might seem a little bit obvious or like, of course, GMs, you know, like, of course they improvise, of course they, you know, adapt the story to the players and that sort of thing. 
Um, but a lot of what I'm trying to do here is one, to sort of codify this process that might seem kind of like, um, like GMs, you sort of learn how to do it, but not a ton of people are talking about like, actually like this is exactly what the process is. So like codifying that process and in doing so, hoping to better understand the design space around um, like, how do we make, um, basically, how do we make things that can make this process easier for GMs in the future, particularly when a lot of this is sort of learned and after you do it a bunch of times, a bunch of years, um, but might be more uncomfortable for new GMs. So like, how do we create that sort of scaffolding to make this an easier onboarding experience? So I conducted two different rounds of interviews with GMs. The first round of interview was mostly about general processes, like how do you prepare for and run your games? How do you incorporate players into the story? And that sort of thing. Uh, with an emphasis on that sort of improvisational storytelling aspect of um, tabletop role playing games, because that's what I was interested in. Um, and then the second half focused on um, how they would run a specific module, Lost Mind of Van Delver. And I created a digital prototype that started to feature in some of these things that I thought might be helpful for GMs in sort of simplifying that process, um, sort of some of the ways that computational tools might start to begin to intervene um, and help out GMs. So this is a list of questions. It's not exhaustive, um, but it kind of gets a feel for the idea of like the kinds of things I was trying to get at in these interviews. And these are semi-structured qualitative expert interviews with GM. So uh, the idea is like, these are just sort of a jumping off point to better understand uh, what it is that um, GMs do and how they do those things. Uh, and here you can see that some of the questions are more general, some of them are more specific. Um, and we basically took the results of all of these interviews qualitatively coded them and then use that coding in order to sort of pull out the salient themes. Like what were the things that came up? What were some examples of that? And I'll be talking a little bit about those results in this talk today. Um, this is a list of the GMs from the first round of interviews. There's actually a bunch of overlap between the first and second, which is why I don't include a list of the second round of interviews in this talk. Um, but you can see that there is a spread of people of different levels of experience, some novice GMs, some that have been playing a really long time, and then also a spread of different game systems that the GMs have played before with a little bit more variety coming from um, those expert GMs or people that have played a lot. Um, and yeah, and so, so first I'm going to be talking a little bit about what came up during those interviews in terms of the techniques that GMs use for um, this improvisational storytelling process. And then second, I will be talking a little bit about the specific um, Lost Mine of Fandelver um, digital prototype that I made and what were sort of the results of that. So one thing that GMs talked about as important to their process is getting players invested in the story. So a lot of what GMs are doing is sort of managing player attention at the table, making sure that everyone um, you know, has something to do, has something that they're interested in, um, providing players with personal stakes. So uh, one way in which GMs do that is by um, talking to the players um, and also like looking at character sheets and that sort of thing, saying, oh, what is it that the players might wanna do based on who these characters are? Like maybe if they're a rogue, they want to be sneaky or they want to like have opportunities to pick locks or maybe they just want to like backstab people a whole bunch because that's fun too. Um, and then also using connections with NPCs in the world in order to sort of motivate players to do things. So like if the players have someone that they like, someone that's their friend, and then their friend, you know, asks them to do something, they might be more likely to do it. Uh, GM's talking about sort of using that as an incentive to sort of be like, oh, hey, I can get players to do this thing that I want them to do by creating those like personal stakes for them, getting them um, actually wanting to do the thing themselves. We also see this idea of GMs wanting to sort of adapt um, what the um, basically take on the things that the players do and create consequences for those actions. One way that GMs describe doing this is um, all of these, the quotes, by the way, are from the interviews themselves. But one GM talked about using the process of a world with momentum with the idea that things in the world will continue to move forward and like maybe bad things will happen. 
Um, but the players can intervene and choose to, you know, maybe alter the course of the things that are going to happen. Um, this kind of creates the idea of um, the player actions having consequences, um, but more importantly, player inaction also has consequences. And maybe players aren't able to, you know, do everything. So you have to sort of pick and choose like, oh, if I choose to intervene here, if I choose to help these people, maybe this other um, group of people will suffer as a consequence. It's a similar idea um, to another idea that brought up of the kind of like failing forward, like no matter how the players act, something will happen as a result of that action. So it's never just like, oh, the world is waiting around for you. Uh, but instead, like the world has this internal logic. And sort of related to that, GMs talk about um, improvising around this sort of internal logic of the world. So if players decide to go to some place that the GM hadn't planned out or something like that, it's like, how can I think through like what would be here based on everything else that I know about the world? Like who might be waiting for them? What might be some of the perils or challenges in that location? Um, and using the sort of internally consistent logic in order to think through um, basically how to improvise around what's going on in the world. Sort of related to that like sort of consistent game world is this idea of um, NPCs sort of being grounded in like who they are and what they want and using that in, as sort of a foundation for the story. Um, so for instance, if players join a particular faction, like who becomes their friends as a result of that? What opportunities are taken away from them? Um, how do NPCs and what they want reflect on how they fight in combat? Like, does that mean that they might run away if they're injured? Does that mean that they might not kill players, but they might knock them out and take their stuff instead? And that sort of thing. Uh, we also have emphasis on creating um, content or planning content that isn't necessarily uh, based on like, oh, at this place, there's this specific encounter and maybe this group of people, but instead creating more, um, more of the idea of like what you might find in the world. One GM called this the idea of like meta prep or sort of planning out like this is the kind of thing that you might find in this world, but not necessarily like planning out each specific location and person and instead using sort of a mix of like getting the feel for the world and setting up those like the possibility of interesting things to happen um, that sort of emergently arise through this like mix of randomness and seeing how the players explore the world. Um, and of course, improvisation is very important to tabletop role-playing games. Uh, one thing that arose, um, and this might seem, I, I think that this sort of falls in line with like what you would expect is that expert GMs were very much like pro-improvisation, like, oh, this is the reason I play the game. I love improvisation. I want things like not structured, just like in the moment, like what, we're just gonna do this. Uh, whereas novice GMs uh, were very much on the opposite spectrum of like, you know, they might sort of like they want to improvise, but we saw many more complaints like, oh, the players sort of went off track and I don't know what to do. Or like, how do I get the players to do like to get back on and learn the information that they were supposed to. Um, this sort of discomfort with the idea of improvisation. And I mean, I think that this makes sense. And this is also sort of starting to highlight this area of potential intervention, like uh, what are some ways that maybe, maybe we can help with that? We can intervene there um, and create like sort of more scaffold experience for novice GMs. Uh, we also talked to GMs about this digital prototype um, based on Lost Mine of Van Delver, which is an introductory module for Dungeons and Dragons fifth edition. Um, for those of you who have seen um, tabletop role-playing game modules before, there's a lot of text, there's a lot of stuff going on here. So this is just two pages from there. And you can see there's um, like lists of characters, flavor text, directions for the GM, um, quests, rewards. Uh, there's a lot going on here. And when you're actually running the game, it means like sort of flipping through this big book and trying to figure out, oh, wait, they went to this place. Well, where's that information? And then like, let me pull up the uh, stats of the creature that I find there and that sort of thing. Um, so one of the things that we were thinking about is starting to um, sort of intervene in um, how we can use computational tools to assist with this process 
is both creating a more accessible version of this information uh, and then allowing GMs to make changes to that. Because obviously, like, you don't want this sort of prescriptive, like, go from A to B to C. Um, and, like, because players are going to do whatever players want to do. <laughs> um, and here you can see that sort of visualization. So this is a generated flowchart based on um, JSON structures. And the JSON structures basically capture, um, like, this piece of information is uh, basically this character has this piece of information and that might lead to this new piece of information or this new location. Um, and this, this visualization captures some of the different story threads that happen um, and players can sort of follow different paths in order to get to where they wanna get to. Um, but we created a couple different ones. You can see the one on the right is like list of characters and information about them. And then this is an interactive version of that. So you can see like you can add new nodes and connect them together. I'm actually gonna skip through this just a little short of time. But yeah, so I think in general, GMs were interested in this kind of like, um, this like computational variant of uh, like a traditional game module. Um, and we can see that there is definitely room for improvement as well. So GMs were talking about like, wanting to basically have more ways of accessing that information and getting at what they want, right? So um, being able to search through things and um, adding their own tags, basically creating something that lightweight that they can use themselves. Um, and then we start to see this possibility of generativity as well. So this whole thing um, is built on like computational structures. So how can we use generative tools and existing procedural narrative systems um, to create that sort of generative process as well that might be more helpful for DGMs? For instance, creating like improvisational suggestions for what can happen next based on what's already happened in the game world. So that's sort of what I'm working on now. Um, sort of creating this database of information um, and starting to build up these sort of like logical structures for creating um, improvisational prompts for DMs. I would love to talk about this more. Um, I know I am short on time, um, but I hope that this is sort of interesting in terms of people doing work in tabletop role-playing games, but also in all sorts of like the interactive storytelling space. Thank you so much for your time. And I would happy to be, <laughs> I'd be happy to chat more during Q and A. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you. That was awesome. And yeah, absolutely. We will definitely have more time um, once everybody's had a chance to go. <laughs> uh, so moving right along, uh, we next have Chloe Germain talking to us. Um, and her talk is entitled, The Forest Doesn't Want You Here, an eco-critical reading of contemporary horror role-playing games. Um, and I think Chloe should be able to share her Hi. screen. Much. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I can't share my video or my screen, I believe. Oh, no, I can share my screen, but not my video. But that's fine. You don't need to see me. <laughs> okay. Oh, I don't know why you're, why? Hmm. That does, I mean, at least we can do the screen share. I'm not sure. Today is the glitch day, apparently. Um, <laughs> uh, okay, well, let me go ahead and just, yeah, I'll introduce you more properly, and then we'll get going. Uh, okay. So uh, Dr. Chloe Germain is a senior lecturer in English at a Manchester Metro uh, Metropolitan University. She's a key member of the Manchester Center for Youth Studies, and her recent publications examine the youth-led climate strikes as collaborative cultural texts. Chloe is a member of the Manchester Game Studies Network and is a game designer. Her research in this area examines the affordances of board and role-playing games in engaging diverse audiences with the issue of climate change. Thank you for that. Um, right, so you can't see me, but you can see my slides. So that's all we need. So I'm gonna start my paper by setting the scene. Um, it's the end game of a short horror role-playing game, The Court of the Radiant King, written for Trophy Dark by Monkey's Paw Games. We, the player characters, are barely holding on to our sense of selves, having navigated a wooded labyrinth, evaded slavering beasts with the human faces of those we've wronged, 
and found our way into the ruins of a former court in the heart of the forest. Before us lies a gleaming treasure pile composed of items deposited by all those who've attempted the journey before and never returned. And atop it all, the crown of the king. It's too much of a temptation for an adventurer as ruined as myself, so I take my dagger and I plunge it into the back of one of my erstwhile compatriots, lunging for the prize and sealing my fate as the latest victim of the Radiant King. Many horror role-playing games promise an experience similar to what I've just described, a series of encounters with monstrous beings, a descent into bodily or psychological disintegration, a sojourn in an antagonistic landscape, and the peril of opening oneself to inhuman forces. This mode of role-playing draws on the genres of the dark fantastic, including the uncanny, the weird, and the gothic. And it evokes the weird nature from Alden and Blackwood's stories in which protagonists are either persecuted by or else give themselves over to an animate landscape. The tagline of Trophy Dark, a role-playing game by Jesse Ross, promises players a fateful adventure in a forest that, quote, doesn't want you there, end quote, recalling Blackwood's story, The Willows. While such role-playing games tend to be viewed viewed through theories of affect in the tradition of horror film criticism and held to provide catharsis or posited as means of negotiating social anxieties, I'm going to say in this paper today that I think horror role-playing games have much to offer eco-critical thought in a time of climate crisis. I believe there are modes through which we might foster ethical relations with the more-than-human world. The eco-philosopher Bruno Latour says that ecology is driving us crazy, diagnosing pathological responses to the climate crisis like denial, hubris and depression. There is, however, quote, no cure for the condition of belonging to the world. But by taking care, we can cure ourselves of believing that we do not belong to it, end quote. Playing Trophy Dark and other contemporary indie horror role-playing games is one strategy for dealing with that condition of belonging to the world that the climate crisis has brought to the fore, of confronting human interdependence with a natural world from which we have never been separate, despite centuries of denial that this is the case, particularly in the minority world. In this paper, I suggest that RPGs engage imaginative encounters with what the philosopher Tim Morton calls the symbiotic real, defined here on the slide. The ragged modes of interdependence and symbiosis Morton describes here play out in horror role-playing games as our characters engage in imaginative acts of creation, encounter and worlding with hosts of more than human beings, perhaps even adopting the role of one such being. Morton's description of the symbiotic real through the word host, meaning both friend and enemy, evokes the ambivalence of Trophy Dark and other RPGs that stage transformative encounters with seemingly horrifying landscapes and entities. In Trophy, the transformation is managed mechanically through ruin. When characters reach a score of six ruin, they are given over wholly to the host landscape. The rules allow characters to choose to work with the antagonistic host before this occurs and so reduce their ruin score, but this means sabotaging their companion's efforts to navigate the terrain. Ruin is a ludic and narrative device then through which players negotiate their situatedness within the symbiotic real of the world they've entered. Beyond role-playing games, the dark fantastic is a mode for negotiating the ambivalences of the symbiotic real in a time of climate crisis. Biophilic, that is nature-loving representations, only get us so far because there's a far more pervasive disposition at work in the culture of minority world, and that's ecophobia. The definition of ecophobia I'm using comes from the Canadian eco-critic Simon Estock, who identifies it as a cause of the climate crisis rather than a symptom. And as you can see from the quotation on the slide, he suggests that it pervades much contemporary media. Ecophobia is a uniquely human condition of antipathy towards nature, a maladaptive evolutionary strategy stemming from a need to control. It's no wonder then that in the face of the complexity and scale of the climate crisis, which is above all a reminder that our control of nature was only ever illusory, that ecophobia proliferates. Horror media is shot free with ecophobic representations of nature, and it's a less than ideal storytelling in some ways for negotiating the climate crisis. However, 
while casting nature as a vengeful monster to be defeated is hardly conducive to climate action, a dose of the weird, the uncanny, or the, uncanny, or the gothic can foster intimacy rather than separation. In the RPGs I identify in this paper, those modes are all deployed as aesthetic and ludic modes that disclose what Morton has called dark ecology. Ecology is dark because to encounter the symbiotic real, we need to be, in Morton's words, sufficiently creeped out. Other eco-critics have also identified the gothic, the uncanny and the weird as productive for moving beyond what Sarah Dillon calls the dead end horror of the Anthropocene to narratives that advocate for more intimate dispositions towards nature. Morton describes ecological awareness as glimpsing, quote, the monster in the dark mirror and you are a cone in one of its eyes, end quote. He encourages his reader to become creeped out by humans and their planet destroying actions. What was once familiar, human being, human production, human consumption has become strange and reconfigured as monstrous. Elsewhere, the philosopher Brian Anishi explores the eco-weird apparent in climate change fiction as a mode that uproots our feelings of homeliness in the face of epistemic limits. Quote, the very laws of nature are broken, leaving us in a newly realized foreign world, and we ourselves are left untrustworthy narrators of our own experience. End quote. Horror RPGs such as Trophy Dark stage just such an experience of this eco-weird in their complex interplay between greedy and unreliable human adventurers and an antagonistic sentient landscape that seeks to reclaim those that would consume, conquer and exploit. I propose that by engaging these modes of the dark fantastic, horror RPGs reveal the haunted and damaged landscapes of the Anthropocene, evoke intimacy and interconnectedness with a more than human world without recourse to human control. They unhome the players from a modernist disposition towards nature that would hold it as separate to the human. And they perturb fantasies of ecology as composed of stable, manageable systems and racist anthropocentric assignations of value based on holism, that is on everything having its natural place in the system. Dark ecologies are dynamic, changing, and their members are not subservient to an idealized whole. In the British folk horror role-playing game, Solemn Vale, for example, player characters enter an isolated rural village populated by unfriendly locals who refer obliquely to eldritch superstitions and violent ritual. The game riffs on the folk horror genre exemplified by mid-century cinema like The Wicker Man. However, unlike the reactionary disavowals that tend to play out in the climax of those films, Solemn Vale engages the player in a series of choices through which their interaction with the land becomes ever more intimate. In the scenario Family Matters, GM'd by Matthew Dawkins for the Red Moon Roleplaying Podcast, the player characters enter Solemn Vale intending to claim an inheritance, but increasingly strange revelations about the family's hidden history puncture their fantasies of a quiet life in the country. During the climax of the game, the player character stands over an abandoned mine shaft on her newly acquired property, deciding whether to feed an antagonistic local to whatever lurks below. In so doing, she will rekindle the pact her family once had with the inhuman powers underlying the landscape of the Vale. Here, a romanticised and racist vision of Britain's rural past is exposed as always already bound up in the dark machinery of agri-logistics and the excavationary logic of capitalism. Humans and more than humans, including the land itself, are intimately bound in dark relationships, inclusive of exploitation and custodianship. And to face this is to give over the fantasy of control that pervades modernist thought. Another game that's worth mentioning here is Gordy Murphy's Hollows of Desolation, an RPG built on the mechanics of trophy in which players invent and explore a collapsing ecosystem, the hollow, to bring back treasure. A ravaged and animate landscape emerges in play through the interactions of the GM, the players and the world itself. Mechanically, magic in the game functions as a metaphor for exposing the magical thinking of extractive capitalism. If player characters use magic, they accelerate the collapse of the hollow and dangerous dredge effects manifest, such as monstrous creatures or toxic extrusions. Such dredge effects emphasize the interpenetration of human and more than human worlds. And rather than being determined in advance by a rule book or a scenario, dredge effects are explored in play and in metagame conversations that occur around play. 
Through such mechanics, the game presents ecosystems, not as stable holes, but as unstable, open systems. This punctures a notion of ecology rooted in teleology and cybernetic fantasies of human control. And the loss of control is given imaginative force through dark, fantastic aesthetics. In one game that we ran, a player decided that the collapsing hollow had partially swallowed his former ancestral home, and they began their exploration in the degraded and decaying get grounds of the house, concretizing that uncanny and harming aspect of the eco weird. Many of these horror role-playing games draw on collaborative storytelling techniques as well as more classic mechanics. Immersion is frequently punctured as players move in and out of the story to discuss potential consequences when we roll ruin, dredge or weird dice, for example. So they're meta games as well as storytelling games. Stephanie Bollock and Patrick Lemieux identify metagaming through an alternative history of play outside the commercial logic of the video game industry, describing it as a critical practice of playing, making and thinking, an intervention into the political and cultural economies in which we're situated. As this spread on building the environment shows, Hollows is exemplary of the ways in which contemporary RPGs invite players to metagame. The ecological ethics of the game further suggests a connection between metagames and what Karen Barrett's called, quote, the ethics of worlding. Her theoretical framework argues that, quote, the very nature of materiality is an entanglement. Matter itself is always already open to and entangled with the other. The interactively emergent parts of phenomena are co-constituted. Not only subjects, but also objects are permeated through and through with their entangled kin. Ethics is therefore about responsibility and accountability for the lively re relationalities of becoming of which we're a part. So this is quite complex stuff when we verbalize it as theory, but ethical principles that Barrett's talking about here emerge intuitively when we play games like Hollows and Trophy. We're not creating an environment that's a passive background for adventurers to explore. We're not mapping a dungeon, fighting the bad guys and escaping with the loot. This is an exchange between the game master and the players and also the world itself. In Trophy, Hollows and Solemn Veil, vale, the imagined environment discloses its subjectivity in play. The environment that players build in hollows in turn builds itself as we describe new encounters, discuss dredge effects and consequences of our exploration. Nick Mitz's investigation on tabletop role-playing games emphasizes that the agency the games confer upon imagined worlds is a potential affordance of the hobby as a whole. Quote, the element of the unknown depends on cultivating and respecting the concreteness of the imagined world rather than bending it to meet other goals the players might have. End quote. I think this concreteness of the imagined world and the respect it engenders in players is readily apparent in games such as Hollows, where it takes on an eco-ethical dimension. And to conclude, um, as Anna Singh suggests, we're currently living in a world in ruins and precarity is a condition that pervades all modes of life, although some more than others. Our culture, politics and daily lives have yet to adapt to these new conditions and we continue to be mired in modernist modes of thought and beliefs about our relationship to the earth. Latour reminds us that, quote, an alteration of the relation to the world is a scholarly term for madness, end quote. In a time of climate crisis, such madness is upon us, whether we would wish it or not. The RPGs I, I identify in this paper invite particular modes of alteration, negotiating the horror of the Anthropocene to foster new dispositions towards the more than human world. They recognize the precarity of the world and the complex interdependence dependence and intimacies that comprise it. These are end games for the end game. And if ecology is driving us mad, then we might all benefit from gathering around the table and rolling some dice. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much. All right, moving right along. Um, we next, uh, and actually our final speaker for the day or uh, for this panel, um is Colin Strickland so we're gonna hopefully get, be able to have Colin start sharing his screen um he will be talking about reframing actual plays non-human influence in performative play and just a little bit about Colin Colin is a PhD student in the Georgia Institute of Technology's digital media program his research focuses on collaborative storytelling in hybrid environments by examining the shifts in emergent behavior that appear when play moves from the analog to the digital world, his work articul articulates the complex relationships that form between people, formal systems, 
and networks of power. So, and with that, we will go ahead and have uh, Colin present. Thank you. Hello, hello. Can everyone see and hear me? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Excellent. And let's get the show on the road. The title of this presentation is Reframing Actual Plays, Non-Human Influence in a Performative Play. And in large part, my work is about looking at more YouTube comments than any human should. But don't worry, I'll truncate slightly during the research description. Can I move to the next slide? Beautiful. My name is Colin Strickland. I'm a PhD student in the digital media program of the Georgia Institute of Technology. And as you may be able to guess from the blurred shapes of Munchkin, Shadows Over Camelot, and Betrayal at House on the Hill in the background of my headshot there, I'm also an avid tabletop gamer. Over the next 10 to 15 minutes, I'll introduce you to the Glass Cannon Podcast, a tabletop role play show and the object of my analysis. My particular interest lies in the program's performative context, and I pay special attention to the audiences who watch rather than just the performers who entertain. From there, I'll provide a short look into the underlying theory that motivates this research before diving into the methods of corpus analysis that I've used to construct my analytical framework. Finally, I'll share the results from that analysis before concluding with their implications for a formal description of the tabletop role play show. All of the above can be understood fundamentally as an exploration of RPG aesthetics. So then, let's get to it. By the end of this presentation, I'm hoping to have an expanded model of digitally mediated RPGs, as well as an explanation for how best to formally describe their performative situation. At its highest level, my research is focused on active audiences and the digital transmission of analog gameplay. In other words, the people who watch tabletop role-playing shows and participate in their fandoms. Now, you've probably heard of these shows. I'm guessing some of you guys watch them. The Adventure Zone, Critical Role, Harmon Quest. This sort of programming can be lightly edited, presented in its entirety, animated after being recorded before a live audience, or viewed synchronously on platforms like Twitch. Regardless of the diversity of format and form, however, TRPG play always features as a core component of a tabletop role play show. So for my test case, I settled on the Glass Cannon podcast. It uses the Pathfinder first edition rules, a system noted for its mechanical complexity. And the concomitant rules arguments are a useful marker in machine assisted discourse analysis. Lucky me. Uh, they're also a mid sized show meaning that there'd be enough fan interaction to populate my models, but not so much as to overwhelm human interrogation. But perhaps most importantly, the GCP is a self-reflexive group, often discussing useful questions on air. For example, in episode 276, The Mighty Ducks, GM at Troy LaValley opens by asking, are RPG streamers and podcasters playing the same game as people who don't play for an audience? I was excited when I heard this business because it articulates a question at the core of my research interests. In the ensuing discussion, the group quickly agrees that the answer is flatly no, they're two very different games. With player Skidmar actually saying, quote, in the beginning, when people would literally just put their iPhone on note record and just put it in the middle of the table, they would be literally playing their home game. But that's not a good show, end quote. That of course raises the question, what is a good show? And, and so you begin to see where aesthetics enter the conversation. It's a question informed by the field of performance studies, in particular by performance scholar Richard Schechner. Art creates its own reality, says Schechner, and actively interacts with social life. In other words, the worlds of art and of the social are not separate spheres, but mutually constitutive. And that overlap is particularly interesting in the context of RPGs. In his book, The Fantasy Role-Playing Game, new, A New Performing Art, Daniel McKay draws on Schechner's terminology to formally theorize TRPGs. He assigns various elements of the interactive gaming experience to drama, script, theater, performance, adapting RPG play to Schechner's performative paradigm. Now, notably, McKay argues that his model is interesting quote, because of the lack of performer-spectator division. Role-playing games simply do not have observers who remain apart from the action. Now, this sentiment echoes Robin D. Laws, who once wrote that interactive gaming is in its very essence highly resistant to critical analysis. This is because the gaming experience itself is not set up to be observed by outsiders. 
Now, obviously, what was true in 2001 is no longer quite applicable in 2021. There are outside audiences now. And so even if McKay's model is well theorized in terms of performance studies, it doesn't necessarily fit the new performative situation, even if RPG play remains core to this context. So for tabletop role play shows, there is an outside audience distinct from the player performers of a home gaming experience. And that audience needs to be accounted for. So let's trace McKay's work one step further then. In addition to Shetner's taxonomy, McKay follows up on Gary Allen Fine's classic shared fantasy, a sociological exploration of TRPG cultures. Fine was a participant observer of a D&D gaming club in the Bay Area circa 1979, and he relied on Irving Goffman-style frame analysis for this task. So in shared fantasy, Fine settled on three primary frames to describe the situation of a typical tabletop role play game. The social, gameplay, and game world. These frames correspond to the relationships of the people at the table, the game as a game, these are the, its mechanics, and the fictional world participants build together. So we have three frames devoted to people as social beings, players as ludic beings, and characters as narrative beings. Now, into this mix, I also like to add Robin Hope, a scholar who wrote her thesis on the popular Critical Role Dungeons and Dragons podcast. And her contribution was to add an entertainment frame to accommodate the performance context of actual play. And that makes the mental shorthand for these frames for people, players, characters, and performers. So far, we've seen RPG play theorized in terms of performance. Acknowledging that outside audiences fundamentally change the performative situation, we now need to ask what frame those audiences inhabit. And this is where the techniques of corpus analysis come into play. So corpus analysis, for those who've never heard the term, refers to computationally assisted techniques for looking at large texts. And if it's my goal to understand how outside audiences fit into a performance model, it can help me to answer certain questions. To wit, how do audiences interact with these texts? Which frames seem to hold their interest? Here's my method. Using the YouTube data tools hosted by the University of Amsterdam's Digital Methods Initiative, I scraped user comments for eight episodes of the Glass Cannon podcast on YouTube. I next enlisted the aid of three volunteers, and we manually sorted through these, con these comments into four theorized frames, social gameplay, game world, entertainment. My goal was to discover whether audiences displayed more interest in a particular frame. What exactly were the conversations about? Fictional characters? The relationships between players? The show as a show, perhaps? So to answer these questions, I relied on a suite of freeware corpus analysis tools called AntConc, developed for concordancing and text analysis. The initial strategy was to mine keywords from those eight hand-coded episodes, terms that were associated most clearly with one of my four frames. From there, I could compare my keyword lists to the entire corpus, using the results as a rough determinant for where the conversation lies. A few of the top words in each category to give you an idea. Under entertainment, we had terms like watch, episode, content, and GCP, the initials of the show. Under gameplay, rules, attack, grappled, fight, combat being the most mechanically intensive aspect of play. Under the game world, words like festival, creepy, legend, and proper nouns like character names or place names. And for the social frame, we had player names. Words like laugh. Descriptions of physical presence, such as the word looks and the word banter. With this concept of keyword lists corresponding to our four frames, there are a few early insights worth discussing. First is the issue of laminated frames. In terms of the frame analysis that undergirds this study, laminations are the concentric onion skin aspect of frames. They overlap one another, bleed into one another, but not equally. The manual process of tagging and coding reveals significant overlap between the entertainment and social frames, 95 cases, and the gameplay and game world frames, 35 cases. For example, the name of a cast member might indicate an interest in that entertainer's persona, entertainment, or in the social dynamics at the table, social frame. By the same token, a fictional concept like gold pieces that belong to the game world might also reference the gameplay term, gold pieces, part of the game's economy. So in these instances, my commenters and I would often find ourselves tagging comments as belonging to both frames, and there are plausible arguments for either category. Now, 
What's interesting to me is that I think this goes beyond the problem of listening, as coders have difficulties distinguishing such laminate cases even after lengthy debate, even when the comment is looked at in context. The implication is that the frames themselves are porous constructs. Audiences transition between an in-character and out-of-character mindset keeping pace with the players as they flicker between those frames themselves. So moving past the manual insights, we next turn to the results of the corpus analysis itself. In the 37 episode corpus, there were 1,014 instances of words related to the entertainment list, 676 for gameplay, 398 for the social frame, and only 66 for the game world. And it's that last statistic that I found most surprising. For all comments that could be clearly tagged, only 3% were associated with the game world, the sphere of this fantasy setting and its associated narrative. Now, it didn't take me long to realize that, oh, wait, crap, we'd only accounted for characters and place names introduced in the initial eight episodes. Of course it's small. But even after adding additional game world words derived from later in the narrative, we only found 92 results total. And that still puts game world frame in a distant fourth place. The conversation just didn't focus on the narrative content of the show. Of course, if you've ever employed ethnographic methods yourself, you know that coding and tagging is an iterative process, and that theorized frames are only a beginning. Many comments that coders classified as entertainment contain keywords related to technology. I'm talking about platform-centric words like internet, audio, video, desync, and software. These words came up repeatedly. And that seems to suggest an additional platform or technology frame beyond the category of entertainment. It also suggests that the experience of the active audiences is partially shaped by hardware and software design. So to try and bolster some of my claims, I next turn to topic modeling. Topic modeling is a method for finding and tracing clusters of words called topics in shorthand in large bodies of text. Where my, category, where my category is valid beyond the three theorized frames, could an algorithm pick them out or was this all wishful thinking on my part? So acknowledging that this technique itself is still subject to human interpretation and interrogation, there were some interesting results, provided that, got, that you can read this stuff quickly. So by my reading, and it's only one reading, the topics identified by the algorithm correspond to the word counting we've already seen. Game mechanics in topics zero and two show familiar words like attack, abilities, target, and grapple. And when you dive down into the episodes that bear the strongest relationship to these topics, you find armchair generals picking apart the plays that players made during the episodes. Topic four had plenty of keywords from the social frame. Troy, Joe, and Skid are three cast members' names. But this is where interpretation comes in. When you look at the text of the comments that correspond to this topic, the sentiment expressed is general appreciation for content. We love you guys about sums it up and so gets lumped into entertainment. Commenters are reacting to micro-celebrity personas rather than commenting on the interrelationships at play at the table. The final identifiable topic is technical. Conversation, conversations about ads on YouTube and the dynamic lighting function of Roll20 feature prominently down in topic seven. Now, you might notice game world words sprinkled throughout. Place names like Nidal or character names like The Professor appear seemingly at random, yet they do not coalesce into solid game world discussions of their own. In fact, when we look at the whole of the corpus across all 37 episodes, again, I hope you have glasses, it becomes apparent how rarely discussions focus on the game world frame. Even the social frame only manages to overshadow entertainment once, and that's in episode 23. If you can see there where that orange bar overshadows its brethren. And that's when a demonstrative player has a meltdown over his character getting permanent blinded. You can track the combat heavy episodes at a glance as well, with 8, 22, and 27 featuring some of the more mechanically complex moments of the corpus. You're just looking for the larger yellow bars to see what I'm talking about. Of course, that suggests that audiences respond to what they see. Of course, the conversation will center around what's being presented. And when it comes to techniques of corpus analysis, it's always a good idea to dive down into the text and get a human eye view of what's being represented digitally. So that was quite a bit of stuff. What does it all mean? I set out upon this project to discover which frames outside audiences reference when interacting with tabletop role play shows. Now, I've only analyzed 37 episodes of a single podcast using a single game system. But for that analysis, the results strongly indicate a focus upon entertainment and gameplay. 
That's particularly notable in the context of McKay, one of the authors that was my starting point, who makes a point of the importance of the game world to role play. He's explicit that his favorite parts of the hobby are when the world seems to disappear and he becomes engrossed in the fiction, experiencing the world as his character. He often speaks in a wistful, you had to be there sort of tone, saying that this experience is only available to the players at the table. And in this context, the reduced presence of the game world in the digital trace of a YouTube comment section makes sense. The viewing audience aren't there in the same way that players can be there. The, pre the preceding is the first step towards expanding the model of digitally mediated RPGs and of formally describing the performative situation. I hope to expand McKay's framework, reintroducing Shetner's ritual frame by incorporating the diverse Spanish activities of outside audiences. However, I'd be remiss if I did not also include the effects of non-human participants. I spoke of laminations earlier, and I think it's self-evident that a layer of technological mediation surrounds tabletop roleplay shows. There were 92 matches for game world keywords in my corpus. There were about as many for my proposed technology frame. Bizarrely, that suggests that media that bring us our fantasy world, that uh, the media that bring us our fantasy worlds are at least as important as the worlds themselves. And the implications for design, both of games and of screens, remain the subject of my ongoing research. So that concludes my presentation. I'd be happy to take any questions along with my fellow presenters. Oh, thank you so much. That was an excellent segue. <laughs> um, so yes, we have ample time uh, for questions. If uh, I keep asking if people have questions, put it in the, go ahead and put it in the Q&A. And yes, somebody has taken me up on that, excellent. Um, so uh, Colin, I believe this question is for you. Um, Peter is curious about this possible cyclical nature of the comments on the actual play sessions. He was looking at the bar graph and they kind of um, had a cyclical nature to them. Do these follow the beats of stories in general? Are there beats in RPGs as, as there are in, in stories? Oh, oh and yeah. Peter's clarifying that anybody can feel free to answer that question. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, for that, that graph in particular, every uh, chart was the, uh, an individual episode. Sorry if that was not clear. So if you're seeing repeated relationships, it's because there are about as many uh, comments about uh, each of the four frames in each episode. Now that said, I think that in in one of the analog game studies uh, publications, uh, uh, one of one of them, I think it's the first one. One of the essays does talk about the content of uh, of shows and does a uh, corpus analysis, not a corpus analysis, but a discourse analysis of which layer people are at at any moment in a uh, in a given playthrough, and uh, kind of divides up how much time is being spent. But one of the things I'd love to do is get do the same type of analysis comparatively with a different stream in a different system. Pathfinder, like I said up top, is mechanical, and boy, it'd be cool to see this uh, lined up with a rules light system, or hell, even a uh, even with the critical role folks who seem more story focused than the uh, glass cannon people. I bet you could spot a lot of uh, interesting insight and style there. So, Colin, this is a follow-up question. Um, you looked mainly at the comments. Um, I was wondering if you've uh, cross-referenced that with the number of views, right? So, like, are the are the episodes that are more entertainment heavy um, and entertainment frame heavy get more views versus the ones that are more combat heavy or or things like that? I'm just wondering how what what the audience is attracted to, right? Are they, are, you know, like when you're watching it, do you, oh, they're gonna be in combat for two hours, so I'm gonna not watch this episode kind of thing. No, for, for Pathfinder audiences in particular, I imagine that the combat would be more of a draw, so that we could- It's a draw, yeah. A bit more. But if, in an answer, if you answer the question, no, I haven't done that yet, but it's a fascinating question that I ought to be looking at as I continue working. Uh, this is basically a first pass at the research. I got, to, I actually got that big, long, ugly graph uh, working last night. But this is exactly the sort of question that I hope to interrogate. Excellent. Are there other questions? I'm sorry. I just want to hop on the first question yes, there real fast. I'm about to actually post a link in the Q and A. Let me do that. Um, so this paper 
did that work? Oh. Okay, it just moved into the end. Okay, yeah. Um, so yeah, I just posted a link there to a paper that I found that discusses, um, uh, it does sort of similar to the research that I was doing, like interviews with GMs and then like looking at game sessions. And it uses that to sort of look at how GMs um, run their games um, and like how they sort of dealt with points in the story that deviated from um, like the pre-planned content. Um, and the, the way they discuss it is in terms of GMs using like waypoints of the story. Um, so like maybe roughly one big thing will happen, then a second thing, then a third thing. Um, and then waypoints become more granular as you get down into the specific details. Um, so GMs might like stick to like big story beats, uh, but in terms of meeting like a specific character or having a specific conversation, like that became more fluid uh, and like maybe you skip over this character that the um, that the players never met, or maybe you skip a conversation that the players never had. Um, but like for people that are interested in like story beats and like how pre-planned content sort of relates to that improvisational nature of role play, I think that paper is a good one to look at. Excellent. And I just threw that threw that in the chat. Um, and there's another question for you in the Q and A um, specifically. Have you looked at tools that designers use that might be useful for GMs as well? Oh, um, that designers use. Actually, I would be interested if you have any like recommendations for like tools that designers use, I would love to take a look at that. Um, I mostly looked at um, existing like virtual tabletop platforms. Um, and then I looked at advice that designers have talked about for like how they run their games and like how they improvise. But I wouldn't say like looking at specific like tools that designers use to design their games. So actually, that would be a really interesting thing to look at as well. Awesome. Uh, and Chloe Evan Torner has a question for you that uh, he unfortunately can't put in the Q and A because for whatever reason the hosts and co-hosts are not allowed to use the Q and A, which has been very baffling for the last two days. Um, but for Chloe, how do these RPGs connect with other media, particularly film and TV? in their representation of uh, eco ecological end time horror? So I think, thanks for that question, Evan. I think that um, horror RPGs are often riffing on the same, the same kind of cultural material that's in, that surrounds as films and TV are, right? It's not that they're necessarily adapting stuff that already exists. Oftentimes RPGs are doing something first and then film and TV doing it later. Um, but I think that where RPGs are significantly different is this um, the, the meta gaming quality that allows you, even if the base game or the base scenario is kind of like a core ecophobic, like it's representing nature as an antagonist or nature is monstrous or humans are separate from nature or it's kind of a riffing on loss of control, that the meta game affordances of RPGs allow, are allowing you to interrogate the premises of that and interrogate the aesthetics and ethics of that. Whereas if you sit and watch, you know, um, like a film about a tidal wave destroying New York. Like you're just consuming that ecophobia and you can respond to it. You can interact with it like afterwards. You can talk to people about, you know, whether you liked it or not, but you can't intervene in, in the way the narrative um, unfolds. So I think that uh, particularly the, the, the collaborative storytelling RPGs where world building is part of the RPG play experience, like world building, like we're talking about story beats, story beats in trophy often, you know, you're pausing and you're stopping and you're saying, right, like the GM might say, okay, tell me one thing as you walk down this corridor, tell me one thing that makes you realize that you're, you know, you're no longer alone or whatever. And so then your, build, your world building as you're playing in ways that really can like connect to um, and, and interrogate the kind of ecophobic aesthetics that are, are pervasive really at the moment everywhere. So they're not, all not all eco horror games are like ethically good um, but they have the potential there for that for that interrogation and that and that ethical relationality that um i think that just watching a movie just doesn't have so yeah thanks for that question this is a, a follow-up i'm wondering if there's any board games that do this kind of thing and what kind of mechanics they might use in order to achieve that same thing or is this really only something that you can do 
uh, it's the collaborative storytelling mode of the RPG that that allows you to do. No, I it's funny you should ask that. I've just been writing a chapter uh, for this book that we're working on with quite a few people in the conference here actually um, about nature board games. My chapter is about nature board games and the affordances of nature board games to sort of like be eco-ethical. I don't have a very like positive um, view of that, largely because of the way in which um, board game, particularly Euro game mechanics around resource management, I'd are about um, situating the player as as a kind of almost like this middle manager, like you play photosynthesis and it looks really lovely and your your beautiful trees and blue planets say, oh, our games are produced in an eco-friendly way, but it's like you're a forest manager and at the end of the game, you get the most points for the big tree that you uh, chop down, right? So it's not, you know, it's, and it isn't really simulating how forest ecosystems work either. So I think that there are a lot of problems in board game mechanics, like zones of control, hexes, resource management, consumption, um, progression and point scoring that really like a, a work it, that are working with that modernist enlightenment ideas of humans being separate to nature. And I think RPGs are more fluid, but there probably are some board games out there. And there's one I really, really want to play about old gods and I can't remember what it's called and someone's going to write it in the chat, I'm sure, um, that, that looks like it might be pushing it back against some of those limits. And there's a new game that's on Kickstarter about, it's kind of an, an animist um, game about, um, a, a, a magical forest that you're like pa forest of pangaea i think it's called anyway so there are some coming sleeping gods thank you dylan and there are some coming out that i want to play that i think might push back against some of those like very like nature is a resource to be managed mechanics of board games thank you i'm so glad i asked that question <laughs> um uh one more for chloe and then we have a, a question for all the panelists um chloe there are some chat and chatter in the discord about uh, understanding tabletop RPGs as games to be played versus as text to be read. Have you noticed specific literary tendencies in the text of eco-horror RPGs? Oh, uh, so it's really interesting because if you, um, so uh, I'm, so I'm going to take The Between by Jason Cordova, which is a Powered by the Apocalypse game. It's really cool. It's just come out. Um, it is inspired by Gothic literature and Gothic TV, right? So it's very, very literary in the way it evokes particular aesthetics, settings, character tropes, uh, narrative moments, right? But when you play it, the, there's no story written. So you play, when you play the between, you're investigating something called a threat. But the, unlike in a classic role playing game where you are, um, like what the threat is, like the necromancer that's doing the bad thing that you've got to find out about whatever it's like it's already said, you've got to encounter it and somehow stop it, like a Call of Cthulhu game. The between you just you through play and through your ludic investigations, you the threat emerges, and the um the threat scenario that's pre-written doesn't contain like that that what that is. So the story is literally emerging. So in some ways, they're very reliant on the genres of horror and gothic and weird, and they're like riffing on like Blackwood and Lovecraft and all these writers. But the way in which they are played are, to, are so kind of counter to consuming a, a linear narrative. So it's really interesting. I haven't need to think more about that, but that's a really interesting like... Um, productive like synergy about some of these games. Thank you. And then a question for all the panelists. Um, Haley Steele is, is interested in hearing how uh, all of your works might translate into higher physicality analog RPG media, such as LARP or ARGs. Anyone can answer. I imagine that you could point the same sort of framing metric at LARP, although I'd probably want to uh, want to see if the frames fit correctly first. It's uh, interesting that you ha I had this classic 1979 work, uh, Shared Fantasy, to build off of at the start, which uh, you know just looked at a tabletop setup. Uh, if there are uh, any setups that have done frame analyses of, uh, of LARP itself, that would be a useful starting point for such a study. Um. 
Yeah, LARP's not a spectator sport, though, is it? That's something that's been proved, I think, quite a few times. It's a kind of interesting, you doubt, like, yeah, I don't know, maybe it's in the States, but it's not in the UK. Um, but, like, I've written before about the way in which LARP, like, puts you into encounter like, a really interested way Colin ended his talk about the like the the non-human um kind of um actants to use a Latarian word that are like that are like influencing the discourse that emerges out of these these role play sessions right like the mics and the cameras and stuff like that and I have written a lot about how LARP concretizes through its prop making and monster, like physical monster and prop making, these kind of in- encounters with m- like more than human agents that we, you know, normally relegate to the backgrounds of our daily lives. And like we we tend to think that rational human actors are like the, you know, kind of apex actors in the social world. And we don't, we don't um assign social agency to inanimate objects and stuff. But in LARP, that happens all the time. We're always assigning agency, particularly horror LARPs, to inanimate objects, right? So, and that doesn't always have an e- ecological or ethical dimension, but it can do, and it can be, it can be, you know, de- kind of deployed to do so. Um, and I think that props in LARP are a really interesting way of exploring in human agency. It doesn't really answer the question, but it just I thought of it then. <laughs> the question came up, so. Yeah, um, like one thing that I want to add to that is um, there's actually a lot of really interesting space in the work of like how technology can come together with LARPs in order to sort of enhance the like LARPing experience. And um, I would be interested in seeing more about like the intervention of like technology and um, the storytelling aspects of LARP. Most of what I've seen is there's another lab um, in my program that does like technology that's more like social emotional technology for LARPing. So like using technology to convey like how you feel um, or to like convey different states of the player in a way that's sort of more accessible than like you would be able to just like without um, that sort of technological assistance. But like, that's definitely something that um, I think is worth exploring more in the research. Debbie, you said you said that there were uh, books about technological intervention into LARP. Do you have any titles? For oh yeah, let me see if I can pull up some papers. I think I think maybe a couple of people are beating you to it in the chat, but we can add more always. Uh, yeah, that's great. <laughs> uh, I think Aaron Tramel had a question. Yes, he did. Yeah, this was um kind of a question. Sorry. Uh, yeah. My windows are open. Uh, a question back to Chloe about the uh, eco games. Um, so, uh, um, oh my God, uh, reality is Jane McGonigal has, um, a talk about her old book, like 10 years ago, reality is broken. And in it, she calls for like an urgent optimism about how games can basically save the world and solve environmental crises. And, um, you know, this was a very critiqued part of the book. Uh, and I think, uh, listening to your comments a moment ago, I was hearing you address some of those critiques. Anyways. I, I guess I was curious, like, do you still think that there is a need for an urgent optimism? And do you think such a thing is possible? And I guess, like, how could one collect um, uh, that kind of ambition and, and I don't know, make it so that we have an inhabitable world in uh, 50 years? I was just reading something about this recently and it's it's disappeared now who the writer was, but about how hope is, like, not helpful it's not helpful because because it's about posterity and it's about preserving normally a kind of human or familial like posterity right it's very anthropocentric for a start um and it's also not helpful because it's constantly frustrated because we're not constantly being told and then what what you can do as an individual to halt the climate crisis is very very minuscule you know when jeff bezos is like you know right you know to <laughs> one-handedly destroying the Amazon or whatever with his company Amazon ironically enough and um, so I don't know I I lean on dark ecology and we and eco weird because I think that they're really helpful ways of thinking through the the, the transitional nature of the Anthropocene as something that is shot through with um in 
power imbalances, you know, the effects of climate crisis, as we know, are, 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 are legacies of colonial capitalism for a start. They're also not evenly distributed across the globe or even across particular countries. The fractured and damaged nature of the ecologies that were like, embedded within, like the fact that, you know, it's not just about how much carbon you pump out, but it's about the habitats that are being destroyed. Uh, through consumption and that you're not going to get those habitats back and stuff. And I think we need dark ecology and we need to feel weird. We need to feel creeped out. We need to feel horrified, but those things can't lead to a kind of like nihilism because that is not helpful. And so I like these games because for me, they're kind of, they're negotiating that point on the edge of the eco weird and the dark uncanny and dark ecology before you get to like, oh, well, there's no fucking point, reality is broken. Like it's, it's that before that point, how are those things helpful? How are you able to use those uncanny realizations or feelings of unhomeliness or feelings of being weirded out to re-situate yourself, re have a disposition towards the modern human world that is not the one that we currently like normally have every day. Um, and some of this involves, you know, looking at indigenous um, life worlds and indigenous teachings as well, but, you know, without uh, appropriating those and saying, hey, how can we fix the world after we broke yours? Thank you very much. So it's really difficult. And for me, it's not a choice between optimism and despair. It's about how you use the like dark realizations and what, what you can productively do to like um, shift dispositions shift attitudes um yeah but I think heaven is right that uh, you know Jane McGonagall's work really was ill-timed and reality is still very much broken well great question thank you all right we have uh another question in the Q&A this one's for Colin uh, any thoughts about the parallels between the impact of early modules and adventures in D&D, for example, which were made for competitive play at conventions on the design of the adventures at the home playing table and the crafted entertainment episodic nature of actual play shows and home playing tables? Ooh, tournament play modules versus actual versus actual play that's all freewheeling and dealing. And when I think freewheeling uh, actual play, I think the adventure zone. That's a very fly by the seat of your pants that happened to start with Lost Minds of Fandelver, if I believe, if I'm not mistaken. And out of that was fun all that creativity. You know, modules are often held up as this training wheels version of running a game. But I still like to run them myself, even as an experienced GM. The reason being that if you're overworked, the use cases that you can fall back on what's there. And if you have a little more time, you can add to it, elaborate on it, expand it, discard it as you will, just like you would any home game. Now, as for the influence on a more competitive mindset in uh, tabletop RPGs, yeah, you can find that in individual groups. But uh, my own test case of the Glass Cannon podcast, they run modules. They run Pathfinder Adventure Paths. And, uh, you know, I don't think that that necessarily includes creativity. I know that they uh, actually do some very interesting stuff on their uh, adding backstory elements, which have been adapted for, uh, for an entertainment frame because they're actually reading almost a scripted radio plays rather than playing the game, which is sort of a bizarre thing to see, but it's how they wind up adapting these modules to its use. Excellent. Thank you. And I kind of wonder, um, you know, thinking about like what what does a what would a competitive uh, frame look like now? Um, and the cynic in me is like, well, each show is just competing for for viewers, right? Competing for I know it's terrible, <laughs> but that's where I went. The, the economy. <laughs> with, with I've been hanging around with Evan too much, and his his Marxism is rubbing off. Because um, tell about the capitalism, right? Um, other other questions. Competitive show, something like X Crawl. Interesting. Yeah, geez, how would you cover that though? That's fascinating stuff. Would you have multiple teams and just do a collapsed edited version like a CSPN? Perhaps. 
I'd have to, uh, yeah, maybe this is the this, this is the next level of actual play. <laughs> And this is exactly what I'm interested in as far as the design possibilities. If you realize that, oh, people don't want to participate in the worlds the same way as players, they want to be entertained. If that happens to be true, I have one data point so far, then the implications for design become a little wonky. Which going back to like the title of this panel, is that really then about the storytelling? Is it really about the narrative or is it about something else? <laughs> There's so much shouting in the chat right now. I love it. Yeah, anytime you change the performative situation, anytime you change the incentives for, am I trying to entertain my buddies, these outside people, am I trying to win the game? You fundamentally on this situation. And even if you're playing Fan Delver, uh, the introductory module, the microculture of any given table can fundamentally change the performative situation for that group. So I think it's very much about getting in there with ethnographic methods and seeing and talking to people like Debbie did, seeing why people are playing what they're playing, how they interact with it. Yeah, absolutely. Which actually gets us back to um, Stephen Deschayel's talk earlier, which somebody in the chat ages ago had mentioned that they had they would love to kind of think about all of your talks in relationship to like what he's working on and what he's doing which is just just great i love the the kind of bleed through from panel to panel and then again how is it kind of mediated through this technology which has been a, a theme running through this panel as well other questions for our panelists Haley's interested in whether Chloe thinks, whoops, it went away. Uh, there are games that address ecology in less modernist imperialist ways. Are any eco games doing this well? Well, I don't know, because all the games I picked uh, don't, aren't really, apart from Gordy Murphy's maybe, aren't really touted as eco games. Most of it, most eco games are like very, like, romantic with a big R, like wingspan or something like that, you know, nice pictures of birds and stuff. Um, but it's not, not actually a very eco game, really. But like, so, the, and I was looking at horror games where I'm applying an eco gothic or an eco weird lens in my reading and pulling out the eco ethical potentials of those games rather than them themselves being eco games. But I think that is changing. And I think in the indie horror scene, there's quite a few RPG content creators that are like looking at eco themes and the stuff coming out um, that's going to be really interesting. And I think probably, probably push back against what, what Latour calls this modernist, but you know, it's Haley's identified as a, absolutely an imperialist mode. I might even think of it as an enlightenment mode of thinking where humans are separate to nature. So games that like, that, that like, you know, problematize that separation that binary they're the ones that i'm really interested in even if they're not presenting themselves as eco games necessarily but if anyone's got any recommendations of where you think that's happening ball games role playing games then you know let me know because i'm always interested to play more and and find more examples and if you have any of those examples feel free to put them in the chat or always the discord Just pumping up the discord even more Any last questions for our panel? We had ample conversation, which is good because we only had three panelists, but um, I just wanna, just, if there's any, you know, last dying burning questions. Uh, I wonder if those audience participation games like Extra Life Charity Streams add another frame to the analysis. You know, one of the uh, papers I presented at FPG a couple of years ago was about uh, the first game developed for uh, specifically for Twitch, uh, which was called Choice Chamber, where the audience could vote for what happens on the next screen, whether you get power ups or creamed by larger enemies. And you definitely get to play with a performative model because the, <laughs> in Schechner's terms, the audience takes on sort of a producer role, deciding what goes into something. They get that directorial role. And get a bit of a foot on the stage. Yeah, anytime you have direct participation where it's built into the structure of your performance that you can affect the performance, you know, even something like American Idol, call in and vote. 
you would get to talk about to what extent is agency present? To what extent are you really performing on there? How structured is it? How loose is it? How much authority do you have? And these are all interesting questions that you can go into on a case-by-case -case basis. And I think you should. They're interesting papers. I'll quote them. Okay, we have one more question in the chat for, or in the Q&A for, for Chloe. What about ancient, that is, for example, biblical or medieval, such as uh, Arthur Fisher King, Wasteland? Um, what about these ancient or medieval dynamics read in uh, ecological ways, for example, um, or that is, the impact of the moral spiritual on the land rather than divide between the moral spiritual on the on the one hand and the natural on the other oh yeah that's a really good point it's not i hadn't thought about that but yeah i bet there, i bet there are potential eco-ethical dimensions to some of those games um particularly like things that um, are going back to like medieval or organ organicist kind of idea of, the, of earth, uh, you know, so, so the kind of like divide between rational man and the earth that's there to be exploited or culture and nature, all of these divides, they really come about, you know, in the, in the minority world through the enlightenment in the 17th century. And the romantics to some extent were pushing back against that, although albeit in a quite limited way. But prior to that, the kind of medieval worldview was, it was still hierarchical and anthropocentric, but it was more, more integrated, more organically integrated. So I think maybe texts that like pull on that, like RPGs that pull on that could be a really cool place to look for like potentially ethical affordances and moments and stuff. So yeah, any um yeah worth worth having a having a look to see if there's any of those that could be potentially really interesting. So thank you. Well, and thank you to all our panelists and to everyone participating. Um, we're gonna go ahead and wrap this up. Uh, we have a have about a half hour or so break. Um, so stretch, eat sleep, I don't know, any, where everybody is in, in, in time and space. Uh, and then we will return at two o'clock Eastern Standard Time uh, for our third keynote, who is uh, B. Dave Walters, who will be talking about diversity and inclusion in the content creation space. So we'll all you know, reconvene here again at two o'clock or whatever time it is your, your time. Thank you again, everyone. <laughs>